Los Angeles or between Los Angeles and, at, uh, and New York. He's been uh, teaching and he's still teaching at Columbia University amongst other uh, many other uh, places and lecturing uh, all over the place. He's been uh, also involved in um, uh, a number of uh, publications uh, and now, uh, and that's maybe the, the most uh, interesting thing given the fact that he's a young uh, architect, he's making a very large building in New Jersey that uh, I hope he will show us to today. Why did we invite uh, Greg? Um, <laughs> But we invited him uh, first because uh, he is uh, an architect of the same uh, generation we are, uh, with whom we share, first of all, uh, a very large uh, series of uh, uh, coincidences, uh, f almost physical coincidences. We basically meet each other every two months and we speak for half an hour, so we thought it was a good idea uh, maybe to have him for a bit uh, longer. Uh, but we uh, not only share this uh, series of uh, physical coincidences, we uh, think we share also uh, a number of uh, interest or more ideological uh, coincidences <coughs> that uh, have to do with uh, uh, some form of uh, interest in, in the operative, in the technical, in the use of uh, computer technology as a way of um, uh, producing architecture. Uh, and we thought it was uh, a good uh, idea to bring him here uh, and to let him show us how he does uh, approach these uh, issues. Uh, on the second uh, point, we invited him because we think that he is uh, a very serious uh, architect. Uh, and there are amongst the young uh, architects a lot of people who are very trendy, very uh, fashionable, but we think that uh, Greg is not only fashionable but also uh, <laughs> incredibly, incredibly rigorous, incredibly serious. Uh, he has a fantastic uh, theoretical uh, knowledge and uh, an incredible uh, intellectual rigor. Uh, but what is even more interesting than, than his intellectual rigor is that uh, uh, he has uh, an incredible technical rigor in everything he does. And that uh, we think is something uh, very rare uh, today. And uh, uh, we hope that uh, uh, he will uh, show us also some of these uh, ideas that he is uh, uh, developing now. Uh, <coughs> Uh, and finally, we have invited him because we uh, really like uh, what he does and because we think that in a way the, the, the line of the type of research that he is uh, developing is, uh, as the advertising says, uh, uh, one day all buildings will be made like this. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave you with Greg. Well, thanks, Alejandro. That's a really, uh, I don't know how I'm going to live up to this, seeing as I decided today to not be totally rigorous and be a little bit casual in the talk. Um, I guess I was here about eight months ago, and I don't really move that fast. But I decided I would try to put something together that I haven't really tried before, which is a kind of art historical slide comparison lecture on the relationship between the virtual and the actual. And it's related to this issue that over the last few months, the, the first built project I've ever uh, worked on really with, you know, outside of another person's office is going up under construction. And a lot of things are quickly becoming apparent. And a lot of, of theoretical issues are suddenly becoming much more dominant in my mind I thought if I revisited a few themes that they might be able to have some resonance with the relationship between design and construction. So really what I want to do today is go through 
the construction of this, the project Alejandro mentioned, which is in Queens, it's like New Jersey. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> and, and, and talk about this, this relationship between a certain virtual model and a virtual ethics and the, the concretization and actualization of that. So, first of all, I, I'd want to say that this term virtual gets thrown around a lot. It usually gets thrown around in relationship to computers. That's not an accident, but to say something is virtual doesn't mean to say that it's immaterial or digital or uh, somehow otherworldly. The, the term virtual that I want to talk about is uh, a kind of descriptive moment where something is not yet concrete, but it still, it has a set of virtual potentials for becoming concrete. Now, architects are constantly caught in this space between the virtual and the actual. It was um, uh, Robin Evans who said that architects don't make buildings, they make drawings. And that's actually a statement that's always had a really profound effect on me, that although we think of ourselves as involved in a kind of craftsmanship, our craftsmanship really relates to a set of documents or a set of descriptions, not really to material culture. So is the, the, the discipline that's really caught, and probably the first discipline to be caught between the virtual and actual, this whole relationship is probably what would define architecture. I mean, if you had to say, what is it that architects do, you would say they negotiate processes that are acted on materials, but they do it through virtual descriptions, through dimensions, geometry, uh, specifications, etc. So, I think uh, the the three themes I'm, I'm going to talk about tonight are: first of all, what kind of virtual space do architects want to work in right now? And I think that that's something which is open uh, to critical debate that there are various models of virtuality, there are various geometries, various dimensional systems in which architecture could situate itself. And so I think the first task an architect has to, to address is what kind of space does one think in or what kind of space does one conceive of building in? The second issue is related to this, which is what's the translation of that virtual space into the concrete? And one could say that you would try to keep the translation as close as possible, or one could say that the concrete is somehow a subset and could be slightly different, so that the act of translation could be something productive rather than something destructive. And finally, I think the, the third issue for me is how does one structure a design method, given this gap between what can be built and, and what can be conceptualized? And, and what does that say about a certain kind of authorship and office structure and a way of working with people like consultants and specialists, et cetera. So those are the three topics I really want to talk about. Um, but first, to kind of set the tone for the slide comparison, now I know I'm going to get myself in trouble with these slides. Two days ago, uh, I was in Graz, Austria and was taken by a couple of the students that were hosting me down to Basel to see the, the Vitra complex. And I was going down there to see the, the Gary project and the Hadid project, and they told me, oh, well, you know, there's also an Ondo conference center down there, which I had never seen before. So we went to the, to the complex, and we took a look at, at Zaha's fire station, and I'm sure everyone knows enough about Zaha to know she's very interested in gravity and she's very interested in vertigo. And in fact, of the four of us, three of us were all dizzy walking around the space and you saw handprints all over the walls where people would walk along the, the surfaces holding themselves up because all of the walls are canted and sloped, some of the floors are sloped, and it's, it's a very kind of vertiginous space. So that I think one would say that Zaha was conceiving the building virtually through the drawings, descriptions, and dimensions as a space which was of vertigo. Its gravity was not stable, it was canted, it was oblique, and that this kind of oblique gravity function made everyone slightly nauseous. Now, in the Ando building, 
We know Ando designs his spaces to be very contemplative, centered, stable, orthogonal. And we actually, the students said, they're going to take me to the Zaha building, but then they wanted to do an hour-long interview. And they said, we better do the interview in the Ando so that I would listen to their questions. So <laughs> there's a kind of meditative quality that I think we could all agree was virtually built into the Ando space. Now, what was so striking, and you'll see it in these slide comparisons, is that the materiality of the two buildings was absolutely identical. They were built with exactly the same concrete details. The window mullions and extrusions were exactly the same. The color of the glass seemed to be exactly the same. Even a lot of the interior materials and finishes were identical. So here we were in two spaces, having profoundly different experiences of those spaces, yet in terms of craftsmanship and detailing, they were almost the same. And I think that wasn't accidental because the, the project architect, um, I think his first name is Gerhard Pfeiffer, who's a really good architect in Basel that, that teaches at Graz, uh, or teaches at Darmstadt, was the project architect on both buildings. So probably a lot of the details and construction practices were coming out of this collaborative enterprise the two of them had entered into. But the reason I'm showing you this is not to say that it's a problem that the materiality is the same and the virtuality is different. I just think this is the, the condition of architecture, that there's a gap there. So that despite the fact that the craftsmanship and materials are very similar, the two buildings have a very different affect. Right? They provoke a very different kind of response architecturally when you go to see them. So that I think we'd have to admit that there's an issue of translation here between a certain spatial and geometrical model and uh, a kind of material practice that, that can be productive, right? That they don't have to be identical. Um, and, and the kinds of terms that would come up would be that, that Zaha would have a different technique or a different diagram or a different kind of instrumentalization to think through space so that her virtual model is very different despite the fact that in the case of these two buildings the, the kind of craftsmanship and materiality is the same. Okay. Now, I, I kind of hate to show this. It's probably the third time I've thrown these slides up at the AA in the last four years. Um, but I really believe in beating a dead horse. So the, the model of virtuality that I want to describe. So in this kind of three-step talk, I first want to talk about a choice of virtual space that one conceptualizes architecture in. The, the kind of virtuality I'm interested in would be a virtuality of difference or a virtuality of differentials. Now, the, the model that most architects work with is a virtuality of reduction and of sameness and of whole numbers. So, one of the things I found working with computer technology, both as a designer and in construction, is that whole numbers really don't matter a whole lot anymore in terms of architecture. That you don't have to have a module to build a building, or you don't have to have things measured uh, to precise whole numbers the way you used to. So, uh, for instance, to a contractor or to an architect, the number three isn't any more powerful than the number 3.174. Right? There's really not a kind of essential value we can place on whole numbers in proportion the way we used to. At least there's not a mandate to do it in terms of construction. And, and I have to say that in, in, uh, in Basel, Zaha's building was as precise, actually more precisely calibrated in de <coughs> detail than Ando's. I mean, all of the Ando grid lines were kind of drifting all over the place, where Zaha's <coughs> oblique lines of geometry were very tight and crisp. So I don't know what caused it, but I know that the grid wasn't something regulating in that case in terms of construction. Okay, so the, the two images, the first is, or the one on the left, is a photograph by Francis Galton. And the one on the right is the Palladian <laughs> Villa analysis of Rudolf Wittkover. Now, both of these examples take variation in difference and try to reduce it to whole ideal numbers. So the virtuality that's being searched for is a virtuality of wholeness, of reduction, and of fixity. 
So in the Galton example, he takes uh, three photographs of three sisters frontally on the top, and on the bottom he takes three photographs of the same three sisters in profile, and then in the middle you see the composite uh, alignment of the three sisters in a single image. And Galton called this a genetic image, and his logic was that if you could cancel out the differences and variations and bring forward the similarities, you would get the essential structure for the, for the sister's face. So the misalignments would tend to get blurry and the similarities would tend to get crisp and out of this variation would appear a genetic image or a kind of ideal type. Um, Rudolf Wittkover does a similar technique with the Palladian villas where he takes 11 of the villas, reduces them to stairways, central spaces and, and entries overlays those 11 plans, averages all the alignments, and invents the 12th ideal villa, which is on the lower right. So this idea that one measures differences in order to cancel them away in favor of whole numbers is a virtuality of reduction. Okay, these also are probably familiar images around here. The kind of virtuality I'm interested in is a virtuality of differentiation. In the Wittkover and Galton example, information is measured in terms of symmetry and wholeness. In this example of William Bateson's from 1896, information is measured in terms of symmetry breaking or in terms of differentiation. Now the, the big innovation that Bateson made was that he decided to study form in terms of teratology, meaning he would study mutations as a way of understanding structure instead of studying sameness. So he went around to various collections of monstrosities and in this example he found that mutations of the human thumb fell into two different uh, structures. One was that where you, sh where you would have a normal thumb you would have four fingers mirrored the other is where you would have a normal thumb, you would have an extra thumb mirrored. So this rule of mirror symmetry is called Bateson's rule. But what Bateson found out, or what he realized, is that in the mutations of the thumb, there's more symmetry than in a normal thumb. So if one thinks of symmetry as order, then you would have to make the assumption that the mutations are more orderly than the norm. And Bateson wasn't willing to accept that. So instead, Bateson started to think that the information coding for a thumb was somehow lost, and given the loss of information, the body defaulted to simple symmetry. So that instead of thinking of symmetry in terms of order, Bateson proposed that symmetry was a default condition, which was the absence of order. So that information is, and this is his son, Gregory Bateson, said information is the difference that makes a difference. So instead of measuring the degree of order in a system by reducing it, you measure the degree of order in a system based on the inflection and symmetry breaking. Right? So, so this kind of a model, a virtual model of structure, looks towards uh, differentiation, an unfolding of difference as a way of understanding order rather than the kind of iterative reduction of difference towards an ideal. And, and that's the kind of virtual space I'm interested in. Um, I have three examples that are, uh, I found it's useful to have non-computerized examples of, of this kind of thinking. So this is a kind of proto-computational logic of difference. Um, the first example I have are some images of Etienne Jules Murray's studies of motion. The other are some studies of Hans Jenny. And the third are some, uh, some Gaudi images of um, calculating volts. So the, the first example, which is Murray, is, is a study of difference in terms of curvature. And now I'll explain this a little bit later, but I would propose that after the invention of calculus by Newton and Leibniz, everything is curves. Even a straight line is a curve. It's just a curve that hasn't been inflected. And I'll explain that in a minute. But within the logic of calculus is a subset 
of, of Cartesian measurement, but it's a subset within a larger system of curvature. So that the way one would measure order in terms of Murray's studies is in terms of the inflection of a curve. So rather than studying a reduction to points, lines, and planes, Murray decided to study the nature of curves as a way of understanding order. And what it let Murray see was he made visible the kind of uh, fluid flows of the body, and it also let him measure time-based techniques. Now in Witkover and, and uh, Galton, there's a reduction of time and a reduction of difference. Now I don't, la last time I was here, I talked a little bit about the notion of the animate. But one of the principles of this kind of virtuality is that you can measure force and time in a way that you can't in terms of reduction. So Murray wanted to capture the pulses and flows of the body. In order to do so, he built these machines, which had, first of all, a, a sensor that he would set on a, a vein or artery, which is on the left. And he would attach that sensor, usually pneumatically, to a pen, which would bounce up and down. Then the pen, instead of drawing a fixed point, would draw on a moving piece of paper, like a rolling reel. So that what Murray would generate out of the pulsing of these flows in the body connected to a rolling drawing sheet is a series of curves. And by analyzing those curves, he was able to analyze the pulsing and, and movement of fluids. And he applied that same kind of, uh, well, he invented blood pressure meters, but he invented that same logic of the blood pressure meter to studies of bodies in space. So unlike Moybridge, who is looking for the structural position where a horse would be on the ground or off the ground, Murray was always looking for these vectors that he would draw lines between joints to try to generate vectors and flows that would show how the body was on a trajectory rather than fixed points of stasis. So Murray is perhaps the first to think through a science of curvature in, in terms of, of biology. Um, and, and again, if you, wanted to reduce, if you wanted to reduce this back to fixed points, you couldn't because he's always talking about motion and time. The only way you could describe it is with the mathematics of motion and time, which would be calculus, which, again, maybe I'll talk about in a minute. Um, the second example of looking for differentiation as a method of structure are the studies of Hans Jenny. He invented this term cymatics. Uh, and cymatics was vibration study, or harmonic vibrational studies. And Hans Jenny is a little bit obscure, but he was doing this work uh, in the late 50s and 60s, all the way up until the early 70s when he died. And Jenny was, uh, like Murray, looking for the effects of vibration and motion on form. So the first things he began with, which you see on the left, are these uh, vibrational plate studies, where he would put sand on a vibrating plate, start to study the patterns that the sand would form from a vibrating field. The second kind of studies he would do were of um, magnetic, flu magnetic uh, like uh, sands, ferro sands where he would put a magnet under uh, a piece of wood or paper and slide it around and try to generate form out of magnetized particles. Now, what, what his big insight was, is when he put two of these systems together, he could start to generate coherent, discrete forms. So that out of two gradient fields, the inter interference of those fields would start to generate discrete forms which would have properties in time. He built machines that would actually move these magnets in a repetitive pattern over a, f a ferrous mass. And he captured them on film as these kind of uh, you know, trans transforming figures. But they're figures that always stayed discrete. So his insight was that out of intersecting gradients and the difference that was generated or the friction that was generated out of those gradients, you could begin to generate form. And I think there's some, this is a, a four slide sequence of one of these as it transforms and it, it's kind of the most vertical object he ever did so it looks the most architectural. <laughs> 
And the third example of, of this kind of, of logic of differentials would be Gaudi. I mean, we could come up with a lot more. But it would be Gaudi and the catenoidal studies that he did for the domes and arches. So you see the, the slides are flipped. So on the left-hand side is what the, the model actually looks like hanging. On the right is what it looks like when you flip the, flip the photograph upside down and look at it like it's uh, Sagrada Familia. So what, what Gaudi did is he would build a network of, of strings, hang weights off that network of strings. The weights would distribute their influence through the entire network of elements. And out of that, he would generate a series of vaults and domes and arches. Uh, this is familiar. What I think is not familiar is that Gaudi was basically drawing with spline networks. Right? And, and I'll talk in a minute about topology-based geometry. But this is a virtual model of topology that Gaudi was working with in, in the drawing of these catenoids with models. And again, you know, Gaudi is all, you know, well, he was interested in craft practices. But these, these models are drawings. I mean, I don't really see these as built objects. They're really drawing techniques or virtual techniques. So here you see a, a series of those line networks with variable weights on them. And each of the elements would basically calculate the entire system of influences simultaneously on it. So it's a non-reductive system. OK. Now I think, yeah, if I could get the slides off and the overhead. The what I'd like to quickly do is just a, a kind of remedial lesson in splines or curves, just to give you some of the principles. Um, if you think about a line, or let's say a polyline, it's defined as an infinite number of points that go between, a line is an infinite number of points between two points, each of which have an x, y, and z coordinate. So if you draw lines, you can always reduce every point along the line to two fixed points. You can always coordinate those two fixed points back to this x, y, z coordinate space. Now, this I would call contractor space or building space. This is the way most buildings get built, is with point coordinates and lines. There's a virtual, and, and you can build a building with vectors, I suppose. I mean, you could build like hanging vault structures and turn them upside down physically. And you could design physically in a space of topology and catenoids. But splines are, are similar to lines, only they're vectors that have a direction and a series of weights. And they're based on Bezier's definition of catenoids, where you have fixed points points with weights hanging off of them. And with Bezier, the weights are always hanging straight down. And you generate a curve based on the influence of each of those weights that is not reducible to the original two points. Now, a spline is like that, only you can begin to move the weights around so that and I'm assuming the architects are familiar with these kinds of tools, because basically every CAD program now has spline modeling tools on it. And so the terms that you use to describe these spline tools are you have control vertices, meaning that instead of a point, you have a vertice. So a point also has a line attached to it, and that line has a weight on the end of it. And you can rotate that vertice in XYZ space, and you can increase the weight incrementally. So a spline has an origin and a direction, and it's calculated from its origin point as it passes through a whole series of points as a network. So any point along the spline 
has to look into the future at a, at a series of points that define it. And splines are, you know, they're defined by degrees. So a three degree spline looks to three points in advance to describe its shape, or a seven degree spline looks to seven points in the future to describe its shape. And curiously, a one degree spline looks just like a line because it just goes point to point to point. So the, the interesting thing about a spline is that it is internally multiple, meaning that every point along its length is defined as a multiplicity of points in the future. So unlike a line where every point can be reduced back to a zero sum, a spline has to be calculated with calculus. So each one of these things is a differential equation, and every point along the spline has to look to these differentials in the future to define its curve. Now, the example I use of this kind of calculus logic is of uh, playing frisbee with a dog. Right? That's this, it's calculus in action, which is if you throw a frisbee to it and you want a dog to chase it, the dog is going to have to calculate, and Charles, I remember you reminded me I forgot gravity last time, that you throw the frisbee and the spin that you release it with is one differential. It's moving in space that has gravity because of its attraction to the Earth. That's another differential. You would assume there's some kind of wind blowing it, which is a third differential. Out of those three differentials, the frisbee is going to make a curve. Now, when a dog chases the frisbee, at first, a dog that doesn't know how to chase frisbees, it'll usually run right under the frisbee, and it'll never catch it because it won't be able to intercept it. But after a dog chases a frisbee enough times, it'll start to make a cutoff path and calculate another curve based on the curve of all those factors. So the way you would calculate a system like that wouldn't be to reduce it back to any one variable, like when you throw it or what the wind is. It's a dynamic system that you have to look at all the variables in relation to calculate the curve, right? So that's a logic of curvature, right? The dog isn't just making shapes. It's calculating, right? It, it's doing differential calculus. So that's the same. <laughs> well, it's intuitive about differential calculus, which is something I'm, you know, aspiring to be. So the, the one thing that's, that's specific about a spline is it's internally multiple. And because it's internally multiple, a change in one element, like let's say that element, will cause the entire system to be recalculated. So a change in any, any of the components of the network will change the overall picture of the system. What's, I think, most interesting about them is that because they're internally multiple, they have an intensive relationship to their context, meaning that if you place a force in the space that a spline is drawn in, that force will automatically move each of the control vertices, and the object will dynamically change its shape. So if you draw a box or a square, you would make sure all the weights of that square are exactly the same and that they were oriented exactly orthogonally. And if you did that, you would get a spline that would make a square. Now, if you put that square in a space that has some kind of gradient or some kind of orientation, like let's say a force that's spherical and another force that's directional. Each one of these elements would shift and the entire spline surface would deform. So that the deformations of the splines can be both internal because they're multiple or they can be external because their relationship to the space they're in is intensive, right? So if you're drawing a Bezier catenoid, if you increase the gravity of the space you're in, the catenoid's going to sag. So there's a context relationship there which is intensive, which also doesn't allow you to reduce a spline to a whole number. Okay. So if I...
could get the videotape. So the, and I thought I would actually just fast forward through these because I, they're not going to be that critical. But what I thought I would show you is just some very early studies. These are about uh, four years old now of the, the first time I started using animation software to model architectural space. Now, the animation software has a couple of characteristics. The first is you're always drawing in time. So if you usually have a plan and a section window and a perspective window, suddenly in an animation package you have a time slider that you model with. So the, the first issue is you're, you have to think through this idea of motion and time. The second issue is that you can model with force. So because these splines can have relationships to their context, you can model spaces in terms of points of attraction, uh, areas of directional force, they have, you know, they'll call them typically like gravity or wind or magnetism, things like that, that you can use to attract the geometries you're drawing with. So in this project, which happened to be a competition for the underside of some uh, bridges going into the Port Authority bus terminal in New York, we started modeling the space in terms of the bus movement, the pedestrian movement, and the automotive movement on the site. And when you draw off with forces, you're, there's nothing really to look at because they don't really have a shape. They're gradients. They're like temperature studies. So you have to put some kind of geometry or material into those gradients to visualize what shape they have. So it's like the Hans Jenny example of a vibrating plate, which you don't see the patterns of vibration until you put the sand on it and it begins to generate pattern. So in the very first uses of this animation software, we would model the space with gradients or forces and then throw objects into it and see how the objects would behave. So uh, I, if you want to hit fast forward on this, we can probably run through it quickly. The, one of the techniques that I started using in order to capture the, the motion was instead of freezing elements, we would take phase portraits of elements. So you would take a snapshot of a motion sequence and freeze the motion sequence rather than freezing an instance. And that's something that, that was a, a pretty major insight because this whole time window presents a lot of problems because you never know when to stop things. Uh, okay, if you want to hit fast forward. Okay if you played at regular speed. This was a, a study for a house in Long Island where similarly we modeled a site. It was on the Atlantic Ocean. And we modeled the site for visual points of attraction. So the, the, the lot was one lot off of the beach. And there was a huge Victorian house with a garage sitting between the lot and the ocean. And so the numbers one and seven are the house and garage. And we made gradient uh, repelling objects at that point. And then we put a strong force at the ocean and started to anchor points on the site and study the behavior of particles as they would move around. Um, the, the particles weren't giving us anything that looked like a house. So we took the ground plane and thought that maybe out of the field we could generate a house out of a surface. So here you're seeing we just took the vertices of the ground plane grid and made them elastic and attached them to the forces and studied the behavior. What was interesting is that whatever we threw into this gradient set of forces behaved in a similar way. So it generated this kind of inverted S shape. But you know, whatever we were throwing in was completely unconstrained or unrestricted. So the, actually if you want to hit fast forward again. The, the insight we had here, similar to the insight in the last project where we took phase portraits, was that it was useful to return to ideas of typology. Um, actually, if you want to play at regular speed now. So instead of trying to generate a form out of a field like Hans Jenny did, we started to introduce internally constrained typologies into a charged uh, gradient space. So like those spline networks that have their own relationships internally that then get externally inflected, we started to build objects which had some internal constraints. 
and we used a system called skeletons where you can, or inverse kinematic chains, where you can make joints with limits of rotation and tension, and when you pull on any one of those points, it distributes the force through the whole system. So these soft topological surfaces were internally constrained through the use of these skeletons. Okay, so if you go back to fast forwarding. So these are kind of two, two principles of, of topological geometries, or these virtual geometries. Um, the first that you can model in a gradient space of forces and that it affects internally the construction of the objects you're, you're using. And the second is that uh, you can constrain these objects internally through things like skeletons or through the, the construction of weights and relations. Okay, the third example, actually, I'll just quickly sketch this. Well, you're, you can keep fast forwarding that. Um, the, the other example of a topology based model are these elements called uh, isomorphic polysurfaces or blobs. And with a blob modeler, you have a series of splines that, that make primitive objects like spheres. And wherever these spheres have their CVs overlapping, like the, these kinds of halos around the blobs are the limits of their weights, of their vector weights. Wherever vector weights overlap with each other, the blob, the, the splines will stick together and make a composite. So you can begin to model single surfaces with a series of multiple components. And by changing the position or strength of any one object, you change the entire surface, kind of like liquid mercury. So the, there were a couple of, of installation projects where we use these blob geometries to generate single surfaces uh, that were built in gallery spaces. So, this one is uh, an installation in Oslo, Norway, where five projects were each given a node. Those nodes were given gravity relative to one another. They generated orbits. It was like building a little uh, celestial model in the sense that they started randomly moving, but eventually, because of their mutual attraction, they formed repetitive orbits. And we captured those orbits and use them to control these blob surfaces. So here you see the five individual project nodes being pulled towards one another as they moved orbitally in this space. Now the, the insight in this project, actually if you want to fast forward, these always are best fast. So, and again, I'm, I'm just going to go through these things really quick for the kind of point by point examples. Okay, then if you could stop the video. And I guess I need the slides back. Okay, so this is that installation I just showed you in its first manifestation at a gallery in New York called Artist Space. And here's where we go back to the slide comparison. The, there's a computer rendered image on the left and the exhibition space on the right. We translated this uh, spline mesh or this curve network into a series of faceted uh, planes that we hung off the wall. And the, the faceted planes allowed us a certain expediency in construction but it also panelized the system in such a way that it added a second level of structure and organization to the exhibition space. So you can see in this, in this example where a, top, a set of topological vectors were dropped into the Cartesian space of XYZ coordinate planes. And those XYZ coordinate planes acted like a scaffold to then support a continuous surface that was wrapped around the space again. And these are just some images. That's a, a model of the space. 
these are views of the, of the installation on the right. Now, the reason I'm showing you this is because I, it had never crossed my mind that it might be different to move around inside a space designed with a virtual topology as it would be to walk around a space designed with a Cartesian virtuality. And what I found at this opening is that people kept walking in circles around and around and around and complaining they didn't understand the exhibition space and wanting to know where they were supposed to stand. And we had videotapes there to show them how it was constructed, but they were frustrated by the fact that they didn't know what the, the structure was. When the project went to Oslo, Norway, uh, we used the same diagram which generated a very different surface because it was hanging in space a story above the, the gallery level. So at this opening, it was worse where people were all looking up saying, where's the center? I know that this is a dome. There's got to be a center someplace. And I don't understand how this design was generated. And I kept pointing people to the videotapes and explaining that it was designed with motion, but they kept saying they wanted to stand still to understand it. And that's when I realized that there was a kind of gestalt to using a virtual motion technique which built motion into the forms themselves. And I think the you know, precedent for that would be the Virilio and Peralt text on the oblique, where they argue that a floor that is flat is unoriented because you can move in any direction with equal resistance. But the minute you slope a floor, gravity becomes a motor which directs you so that you tend to go down. So by simply orienting a surface, you build motion into the surface, but the surface doesn't literally have to move. So this idea of a, say, a, a, not to be too much like Colin Rowe, but a virtual and literal movement would be something that you know, one would have to be aware of. That because you're using animation software, it doesn't mean your buildings literally have to move but that in the surfaces that are generated, there's a notion of stored motion that gets unfolded when someone moves through the space. You know, it's very similar to, say, uh, Henri Bergson, who at the turn of the century made the argument that energy and matter were no longer separable uh, entities, that matter had to be understood in relation to its history and formation, so that if you take a rock, the shape of the rock and the form of the rock stores the history in the material. So that the pressure, the orientation, the history is what shapes the rock along with its mineral components. So that you, you look at force and motion and time as something that gets stored in material as a kind of energy that can get unlocked. And I think it's a very similar proposal when you design with motion, you store the motion in the surfaces. You store it as inflections. Um, and if you remember back to those Etienne Jules Murray slides, that's exactly what he was doing. He was taking force and motion and storing it in curves. And he could understand and read that force and motion by the inflections in a curve. You know, it's also a very Gothic idea, like the Gaudi example, where you store gravity in an arch. Okay. So I think this is where the relationship between the virtual and actual uh, heats up, which is the, this example of the Korean Presbyterian Church that's under construction. Hmm. I'll just, in, in a minute, I'll show you and on the videotape tape, some of the ways we generated the project. But for this, for this building, it was an addition to an existing factory building that was purchased by the Korean Presbyterian Church of New York, who told us at the very first meeting that the church shouldn't look like a church in a sense that it shouldn't be, there shouldn't be a precedent. And they also said that they would use no iconography other than one cross on the outside of the building and one cross on the inside of the building. So they left us adrift in terms of representation which, you know, this is one thing I'm, I'm sure that I have in common with Alejandro and Farshid is that I tend to like a situation where I don't have preconceptions about representation and, and linguistics. 
So here we were told that they didn't want it to look like anything. They wanted it to be like a tabernacle in the sense that the imagery of the church would come out of whatever location it happened to be sitting in. And this is something I think most of the Korean churches in Manhattan tend to be in existing buildings. So that there's an idea of taking a house or a catering hall or a, you know, an elk's lodge or something and renovating it into a church and then moving on as the church changes. And this is the biggest Korean church in New York and they decided that they wanted to keep that same logic of addition. So they purchased this factory building, which is on the right. It uh, was built in 1932 by an architect, Erwin Fenichel, and it's right on the Long Island Railroad and has this monumental Art Deco facade on the front. And Fenichel's idea was that it would attract the attention of the train passengers, so they'd look to the clock tower on their way to work to see if they were late. And it's a historic, because of that, it's a historically protected building. So we could renovate it, but we had to keep what was seen as the best part, which is this kind of Art Deco facade that's on the right. So, yeah, it's been abandoned for a couple of years. So the, the strategy we took, and we is uh, Doug Garofalo, who's an architect in Chicago, Illinois, and Mike McInturf, who's an architect in Cincinnati, and Mike and I have collaborated on projects over the last uh, six or seven years. And the three of us decided to collaborate because it was a big enough project that none of us had the expertise necessary to pull it off. So we kind of pooled our resources and set up a provisional team to, to do the job. And the approach we took was to do a series of studies of seating configurations on the roof of the existing building. So on the left, you see these kinds of blob diagrams where you can see here there's an individual primitive or component. It has a zone of influence, and wherever two zones of influence intersect, these surfaces start to get pulled towards one another to fuse. So we thought by using these blob components, we could generate a lot of different seating configurations and adjust those configurations over the structure of the existing building. So the existing building is in brown, and on one line of the building, we knew we were going to have to punch structure down through two floors and excavate foundations. So all of these contours had to be very flexible so that if we hit a particular site condition, we could realign the shape of the building. On the other edge of the building, we kept the whole th structure outboard so we wouldn't have to excavate. So, and here you see progressive uh, increases in the strength of the objects till they fuse to form a single surface, which is on the lower right. One of the, the interesting things, actually maybe if we go to the video now, is that Doug and Mike said at the first meeting we had, we, we had about a week to work on the design from the moment we signed the contract. I mean, one thing that a computer does is it lets you stretch the design time further into the, the design process. So if typically you negotiate a contract and the client says, all right, uh, we want to see something now in two weeks, usually the architect's job is to come in with some image or some some representation of what their building is going to look like. So we spent two weeks doing seating configurations using these blob components and built a series of very conventional cardboard models and did a series of very conventional plans and sections and had a meeting and Mike and Doug both said, don't show them the computer studies because you'll scare them. So. The, the treasurer and reverend and secretary of the church came over and we started to show them these drawings and we showed them some models and they said, well, you know, it looks strange, we don't understand it and why is it the shape it is? And so after a lot of frustrating explanations, we took them over to the computer, we explained the blob elements, we told them the benefits of being able to have a flexible configuration where we could adjust it to the existing building and the reverend said, well, what are the forces on all the blobs? And I said, well, we just made them all the same. 
just we made them strong enough so it would stick together. And he said, well, the altar should have the strongest force. And within a couple of minutes, the clients were starting to model the space by moving parameters and changing values. And you know, those changes were you know, arbitrary or intuitive. They weren't scientific. But what it did is it allowed us to discuss the way we conceptualize the building. So instead of thinking conceptually in the back room and then coming with images of a project, it allowed us to have a discussion of a kind of schema or strategy that uh, could be ongoing. The other thing that's, that's interesting about a, a kind of spline system is that because a change in any element changes the entire spline, you can update things very quickly so, because it's procedural. So certain decisions we would make, two months later we could change elements and the construction history would update the entire object. So it gave us more time to design and stretch that into the whole working process. So the, the images that have been playing on the videotape are a series of transformations of this sanctuary space, which was modeled with uh, spline networks, into a system of trusses with, with vertical columns and into a series of panels that would hang off of those trusses and columns. So the, the task that we set was to have on the exterior of the building one shell, which would curve in the x and y direction, or the x and z direction, and on the interior, a shell that would curve in the x, y, and z direction. So you see here there are two surfaces. One, a kind of shed, which, move, which has columns that change their height. The other, an object that hangs off of that, which has a curvature also uh, transversely. The, and I'll talk a little bit about the geometric transformations of that when I go to the slides. The, the other design aspect of the project is we needed to reorganize the circulation vertically. Since we're hanging this new structure over the top of an existing building, we had to get people up three levels to get into the sanctuary. So the structure on the eastern side of the building was very illogical. So as a way of opening up vertical spaces, we connected between, spline, or between points with splines. So it was like connecting the dots. And then we swept tubes along those splines and just chewed out areas of the building based on those column bays. So we could cut these curved uh, uh, swaths through the existing building and know that we wouldn't have to restructure it because we were always aligned on column grids. So we generated a kind of curvilinear cut out of a series of segmental column grids. Uh, and then this is just showing the systems of the building. This object, which is curvilinear in three axes, the shed that it hangs off of, which is curvilinear in two axes, and then the system of entry tubes which curves between column bays. Since the column bays are all vertical, it's extruded. And that object hanging off the back side is an exterior stair. We, we reoriented the building so that you enter now from the side. And there are two stair entries, one through those tubes and one through those open faceted elements. OK, so if you hit fast forward, I think that's pretty much it. Mm. Actually, if you play this regular speed, you can see in these elements we offset the surface to give it a directionality so that we could bring in all the light and air conditioning through gaps in the surface so that when you look towards the altar, you get a smooth ceiling plane without diffusers and lights. But then when you look back from the altar, you look up into these gaps and you see the cavity of the, of the industrial trusses. OK, so if you stop the video. And go back to the slides. So the, the initial diagram we used of this surface, which was built of spline networks, the first thing we did is, and you see a stereolithography model of that on the right, the first thing we did is we separated it into two offset volumes, 
the one in the yellow, we sliced in the XZ direction so that it, it had splines now moving only on a flat plane. And the second one, we kept so it was uh, curvilinear in three axes. But these were curves now in XYZ coordinate space. They weren't really splines. And these are just showing those elements pulled apart. The concept for the building then was to take the existing building and hang a new object off of it. That structure would be oriented as a series of transverse trusses. And the height of the trusses would change based on the height of the columns, and that would generate the curve in the Z direction. The interior volume initially was this kind of smooth object, which, you know, pers and this is a personal aesthetic. I like to have a little bit more of a gap between these topological surfaces and the system of tectonics and construction that you build them with. So instead of trying to keep this as smooth as possible, we started to try to break the space up to give it a different scaling. So the trusses run at 21 foot grids and we slice this object up into 10 and a half foot grids and offset the surfaces. So you see on the slide on the left, we took the, we took these plates and we put a constant two-foot dimension uh, opening between each one, and that lets us always bring light and air in between the elements. And it also subdivides the space and gives it a scale. So in the plan on the right, you can see the, the new column grids, which are running at 21-foot increments, and then these elements that hang off of that over the existing building. The, in also, the tube geometries we translate it into a panelized section that's always 12 feet on the outboard edge of the curve. And then it fluctuates in the middle so that all of those uh, entry tubes get faceted and broken down into panels. Then on the, you'll see on the exterior of the building, we always describe those geometries with stainless, stainless steel reglets so that there's a kind of metal grid that breaks the building down into these components. And moving down through the plans, and the, the seating plan has changed, thankfully. Um, the, you see the facets of the ceiling turning down and making the walls, and all of the entries are between those faceted walls. There's a, a lobby to the south, and that entry tube comes up from a stair and, and lands, which is on the lower left. And then you see on the upper left the, the out the exterior stair that comes from the parking lot. So you can see the, in the plans, all of those faceted walls are oblique in the X and Z direction, but they're always orthogonal in the Y direction, which gave us a constant set of working points to build them off of. And then moving down into the plans, the next level we really renovated like it was a factory. So that there's, uh, there are about 3,000 seats in the sanctuary space, and they wanted to have as many people as possible be able to eat in the cafeteria. So you see there's one large space to the right, which is a cafeteria for about 1,000 people, and then there's a wedding chapel to the left with seats for about 600 people, and you can open those walls up, and it can be one huge space. And then the, the kind of bump out of the existing building on the upper right is a kitchen. Then the, the only architectural definition of that space is in the ceiling where the faceted objects from that hanging piece articulate themselves in the ceiling and set up a lighting grid. And then it, in the, it's not really the basement, but it's a half level below grade. There are 70 classrooms, uh, a fellowship hall, a library, a daycare center, and offices, which really get used on Sundays only. But there are hundreds of kids that come here and spend like all day. And so they tend to go downstairs and get Korean language lessons and uh, go to daycare while there are the services upstairs. So the, these photographs are about a week old. And the the major 
the, the major design decision that brought it from a topological surface to a Cartesian system of coordinates was when we sliced the object on these 21-foot column bays. And because we were thinking in plan, we spaced all the columns at an equal bay width, which meant that every one of these trusses, which I think there are like 30 or 40 of them per, per truss, those joists were all different dimensions. Because this dimension was constant in plan, it made this dimension different every time because the angles were always different. And so because we used a virtual organization of a plan, it generated dimensional conflicts in that roof plane. So even though it was only sloping in one direction, it became astronomically expensive because every one of our joists was a different length. So what we did is we compressed the distance of the columns and measured the roof instead in topology so that the orientation of each one of these elements was set with a dimension of 21 feet and all the column grids fluctuated in width. So all the column bays are different but in topology the roof is always the same dimension. So virtually it's a box and in terms of cost it's a box. So the project is exactly the same cost as if it would have been a giant rectangle. It's just that we changed the virtual definition of a box to allow us to slope it in one direction. So in fact, you know, I know a lot of architects say that you can't think in, with, a, with alias and a silicon graphics computer without huge budgets. But in fact, this is a little over $100 a square foot. And it's really just construction that's totally industrial and box construction. So. Then in, uh, in there you see those joists and you can, the, you can see the only real change we made in the exterior of the building is stepping these columns and fluctuating their width. And that's what get, lets us curve the building in one direction on the exterior. Then on the interior, we hang these faceted panels which curve in the, in the X direction so that we can get a space which has a kind of virtual <coughs> compound curvature. And here you see these regulated bands that break the tubes down into a module, a variable module, and these stainless steel gutters that panelize this roof construction, also that break it down into a, a rhythm. So, and then the, this is the existing facade facing the Long Island Railroad, and you can see how the, the tower, the, what's the elevator tower, but what gets the cross on the left is built now in concrete. And so that's the beginning of one of those entry tubes that cuts into the existing building. So this whole, and, and here from the, this is the view from the Long Island Railroad going into Manhattan. And you can see, like off here, there's the Chrysler, Empire State and Chrysler Building. So it's about a half a mile off the East River. So you can see that as the train moves by this, you really get a sense for this curve in one direction. Then when you see it from Northern Boulevard on the other side with that external stair, you get a sense for the interior space hanging out the, the back side of this shed. And that's, this is before the, this is just the decking. The roof structure goes on over the top. But you can see that cut where the gutter goes on these 21 foot increments to break it down into panels. And this is a view from the, there's a balcony level that hangs in the space. This is looking towards the altar where you can start to see the curve of that space. And then the, the rendering on the left, the same view. And a view out, that's the tower. This is the tower of the existing building. You can see the, the construction system, the only steel elements that were customized were actually the bracing that between the columns because the columns were all different dimensions. So in, uh, in retrospect, I think the, the issue of the difference between a virtual space and a construction space for us was a difference that actually produced a lot of design. So that instead of trying to build a kind of <coughs> uniform, continuous surface, which was smooth, the allowance for the fact that a topological vector network, 
would drop into Cartesian space of coordinates produced a lot of friction in the project. And that friction allowed us to start to think about a certain repetition of elements, a certain scale of modules, and a certain kind of rhythm of components that we wouldn't have been able to think of otherwise. So that all of the gridding and all of the modularity of the project is flexible dimensionally, and the rhythms they all set up are based on these vectors. So that when you measure the distance between the columns, you get more compression where the roof is steeper, and you get less compression where the roof is flatter. So that there's a kind of Cartesian rhythm that's determined by the vectors and by the topology. So the, you know, the, the fact that you have to negotiate between a virtual model of smooth topological surfaces and a construction logic of panels and frames really is a kind of productive issue for me. It's not a problem that one has to oppose. It's something that you want to exploit. And the, this, I think, is the last view. This is now looking out this, this three-story entry tube right here is getting set up right at this point. And here you can see where they chopped away the back side of the building so that that entry will be cutting right out to the side. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I knew you would. <laughs> <laughs> we are inviting you. Uh, there, are, there are two uh, things that I would like to point at. Uh, the first one is when you say architects uh, work fundamentally in the realm of the, the virtual because their work is uh, about description rather than actualization. Mm -hmm. And yet I, I would say that uh, what maybe is more interesting about your work is that, uh, because I, I, don't, I don't quite like description as it, because it is uh, in some ways a very open uh, characterization. So w in, in fact what I am more interested about uh, what you are doing is that the description that you make is in itself a construction. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that sense I would, I would uh, still like to say that architecture is about construction, whether the, that construction is uh, real or in, in your case is applied to, uh, to this uh, um, production of uh, a virtual model for, yeah, yeah. for reality. That uh, was one point, maybe, maybe you, you can uh, expand on this uh, uh, later on because I have another, another comment which is uh, regarding the, um, the point you make about uh, not being reductive. And uh, I, I mean, we have uh, had uh, to some extent this, uh, this discussion uh, before. But I would say I would like to say that uh, even these incredibly complex uh, uh, forms that you are uh, able to generate with the computers are very um, uh, simple if you compare with the amount of factors that uh, operate in any given uh, situation. And in yeah. that sense, I would like to, to somehow uh, put forward a, a kind of uh, polemical uh, proposal that reduction is to some extent uh, necessary, that uh, it is true, we cannot uh, perhaps reduce the way we operate to whole numbers or to certain techniques, uh, axes, etc., uh, etc., et that uh, ones were useful uh, for us to produce architecture, but uh, in some ways what, uh, what you are interested in and perhaps with what we are also interested in is in opening the amount of, um, uh, or the complexity of the factors that uh, enter into the formalization of the, of the problem, but uh, that will always remain a certain reduction of the complexity of uh, uh, factors that, that influence the, yeah. the design of a building. Yeah. So. No, I think, I mean, you're, 
you're tempering the talk, which I think is, a, is right. I mean, the relationship between the virtual and the constructed, or the actual, I think is the place where architects are. It's not that architects, and you're right, the Robin Evans comment puts architecture in the virtual position. And I would say that it, you know, architects would be in the middle. You're in a translating position. So the role of the architect, and that's, you know, you know, that's the answer to the second part of your question, which is, yes, we do have to reduce the complexities of a situation in order to give it form, let's say, or to give it shape. And the way we do that is by applying a certain virtual set of relationships to a set of construction practices and negotiating that gap. So I think instead of trying to make architects purely virtual and say that architects just manage information would be wrong, and to say that architecture is purely a craft profession I think would be wrong, I think instead you would want to say that we're caught in the middle where we translate. And I think it, I mean, for me, the a concern over tectonics and construction is, you know, becoming more and more of an issue where the, the desire to make buildings look like computer renderings, I think, eliminates a lot of that gap which could be productive. So instead of trying to build things as smooth and monolithic as possible, I think it's interesting to say that construction and virtual concepts are not the same and that that difference produces a lot of architecture. I mean, that's the thing we found when we, that's, this is actually a kind of retroactive observation because, you know, we at one point were trying to keep the, the shapes as smooth as possible and we just decided that instead of trying to compromise it, we would exploit the difference between the diagrams and the building. But, I mean, we found it's more, in, it produces more architecture in detail by allowing that difference rather than trying to subjugate everything to a single surface. <coughs> You know, so more and more, I, you know, I'm suspicious when I see a totally smooth single surface, you know, object. And because there's so much more you can do when you drop that into the space of construction. You know, I mean, it generates its own tectonics. And there generates a lot of problems that need to be resolved and you can actually exploit them. Okay. Charles. I'll get the last word this way. Uh, Greg, uh, <clears throat> when you talk, uh, it's uh, very interesting to, to hear all these concepts. And of course, uh, one is seduced by them and agrees with you. But uh, when I look at the result, I, I have to think that um, <clears throat> it relates to two buildings, which are also somewhat near th the, the same paradigm. And uh, they raise issues of. Uh, what is self-organizing criticality. You're, you're looking at a model in which you inflect any part of it and it inflects some other part, and that's because it's so tightly pulled together. Whereas we know in a lot of historic buildings, they need to be uh, discontinuous and dissectable. So <clears throat> you seem to have in your modeling and in your uh, whole theory a sort of kind of connectedness a priori, which I just, I just wonder about. But what I, I think what I'd like to do is critique your building from the point of view of two really interesting buildings, which I feel also fail in some sense, in terms of an absolute uh, sense, in the sense that great architecture really has to do with the relation between the, the detail and the idea. Let's take Bilbao and uh, the Kansai Airport. Kansai Airport, very interesting conceptually, and uh, the section's very interesting, but it kind of falls to pieces um, uh, at a certain level, because when you come into the airport, your your eyes swoop up and then swoop right down, and you hit your nose against the wall, where you really want to go out to the airplanes. And I would argue, it looks as if that's going to happen in your uh, Presbyterian Korean church. In other words, <laughs> sitting in the back of the church, it goes up and then it comes down and then goes down. I mean, I don't know. You'll you'll tell me. Maybe it doesn't. In the end, but it seems to to be a downer where you want an upper. And I wonder what happened at that altar <laughs> that was supposed to put another view. Uh, 
And the second point, and maybe <coughs> um, stronger, is this question that Bilbao raises and, uh, about cost and the relation between the detail. What I talked at length to the people who built it, and they said that uh, they really had to have, although the structure varies and everything varies, what, what was, had to be the same was the unit, the, the skin, the titanium rectangle. And that, I think, is a great mistake. Uh, but they claimed that the building was only 5 to 10 percent more expensive than if it had all been squares, all right? So it brought out your point that we can now do it almost as cheaply, anything we want. But what they couldn't do is to have an interesting skin. So the building actually looks like it's got stuck on brick in a sense. And in that sense, I think it's a failure. It's a great piece of architecture because details don't relate to the section plan and, and basic idea. And I wonder... I mean, maybe you would agree with that about Bilbao, and then maybe you would agree with, with about your own building that it's it's on the way to uh, a, a paradigm that we don't we aren't quite able to do. So there's two questions: one about the section, one about the the detail. Well, there's I mean, there's definitely there's definitely a shed quality to the church in the sense that the interior has a higher degree of articulation. I mean, jokingly, I call it's a higher resolution output. You know, if you have a, a if, you, if you render something topological, it renders it into little bits. And the quality of the curves and the pixelation is based on the, the resolution of the output. So the interior is a high res, higher resolution space because the, the linear components tend to be, you know, magnitudes of like a foot to four or five feet where the exterior resolution is 21 feet in plane in the roof, and then it varies in the wall. And, but, I mean, we intentionally use sheet materials so that we wouldn't have that panelization problem of the variability. So, but you're right. I mean, the, it's different than Bilbao in the sense that Bilbao is a, it's a poche building. There's an interior surface and an exterior surface, and that's it. Whereas in the church, we consciously broke it into two spaces so that there's an interior object, and then a gap, and then an exterior object. And the shed is much simpler than the interior. But, I mean, you're right, this whole issue of to what degree do you strive for s synthetic relationships of panel to frame, and to what degree do you break a panel off and let it hang free? I mean, that's basically how we generated the interior, is those panels are free panels, and the exterior, they're in plane. The the yeah no that's but we needed to cap it I mean <laughs> the we did you know it, it looks away from Manhattan so it looks at the side of a of a water processing plant and it's an opaque end it's glass at the back side and opaque at the altar side but if you look in the altar that comes to a little bit of a point. But yeah, I mean, the, the whole, the, the issue of cost, though, I, that's a, it's a super cheap building. I mean, the thing we're doing in Austria is, like, literally ten times the budget, and the panels get, like, you know, to one-tenth of the size. But in a way, I'm realizing when we detail that project, we're going to detail it more towards panels and less towards these smooth surfaces, just because it seems unarticulated when you try to make it smooth. Uh-oh, you didn't like that first slide comparison. Yeah, right. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, also the thing that, I mean, we were lucky in this project that we had the mandate not to make it representational, but I think there's a whole nother discussion that, that, should be, that should be happening about the relationship of, you know, how you symbolize something or how you monumentalize something or what, you know, the image of the architecture is when you loosen up this gap a little bit because it let us play with the, the imagery and, and a lot of the kind of, you know, the, the representational valences of things like the elevator tower with the cross. I mean, we could really very fluidly compose those things and start to balance the kind of representational aspects of it in a way that we couldn't have done if we said that the building had to look like the first diagram. You know, so, and I, I mean, that's in addition to all the questions of the, you know, the seating plans. I guarantee have changed radically. <laughs> Um, it, well, some did, not, the, the lighting, we tended to use more conventional techniques. I mean, one thing I found is that the, to model something dynamically, it, it takes more design than to not model it dynamically. I mean, in fact, the kind of automation of the design process with the computer <coughs> introduces a lot more design decisions than less. I mean, typically people would think, if you have a kind of a machine making relationships that it would take decisions away from the architect, but in fact it generates a lot more and it becomes very expensive in terms of time to use forces and dynamics to